a, a, quite a, a blessing to be able to take part in this kind of discussion, um, which for me is uh, very new, but I think it's uh, very important. Um, I'm an anthropologist. And um, what brings me into this conversation is um, research um, that I've been conducting uh, together with an international team um, on uh, religious and cultural factors in responses to and interactions with the BRI and local communities in different BRI countries. Um, so basically, um, as an anthropologist, um, anthropology is perhaps a discipline that's not very well known within the fields of the world of finance and the world of uh, law and um, the worlds where many of these discussions and decisions are being made with regards to uh, very major investments that are affecting uh, the development of local communities in um, uh, almost 100 countries around the world. Now, so just briefly, anthropology means the study of humanity. And so anthropology, in a sense, touches on something very big, which is how do we envision ourselves as humanity as a whole? What does it mean to be human and what kind of humanity are we building? But the methodology of anthropology is actually very, very locally based. It's, it involves going into local communities, spending time with local people, understanding their way of thinking, their feeling, their way of expressing their values, and so on. So um, anthropology involves taking a holistic approach, which is very much um, moving back and forth between the hyper-local and the um, macro-global, we can say. So when we're talking about, um, we, we heard from uh, Dr. Ma, um, this a really incredibly inspiring um, process, which is the materialization of a vision, right? Which is seeing a vision and visions of humanity can be expressed in many different ways. Whether we talk about something like the Zhenlei Ming Gong Tong Ti, or whether we talk about sustainability, whether we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, win-win cooperation, all of these are different labels or terms that may be understood in different ways, but ultimately underlying them, there is something about imagining and envisioning the future of humanity. And then thinking about how we can bring these visions into our world and transform our world to, to, to move forward that vision. And so that's what was very inspiring to hear how Dr. Ma with that vision of sustainability how then he engaged in a process of consultation with so many different actors at the national and international level, which involves then uh, and so many financial and private actors leading to the funneling of resources into um, green and sustainable finance. So this is really something on the one hand, when we're thinking about, or at least for me, looking at it as an anthropologist, when we're looking at developing various types of um, criteria, um, indicators and so on, Behind that, there's also something else and something bigger, which is the vision that we have for humanity. Um, and so these are often um, ideas such as sustainability are really always part of something bigger. And so, for example, when we now have the idea of the triple bottom line, right, where we're talking about uh, people, profit or people, prosperity and planet. So um, how, does, uh, how do our efforts for sustainability um, benefit not only the planet, but also benefit communities and benefit the prosperity of community. Looking at the environment, when we talk about sustainability, we're often talking about um, the natural ecology, how to, um, uh, how to direct resources and make investments in ways that are, um, that are sustainable. And often the, the discussion is at the level of the physical environment. But the natural world is part of our environment as human beings and our human environment is not only physical, it's also social and spiritual. So when I talk about social, we would talk also, this involves both the, the political, um, the cultural, all of these dimensions that create the human environment in which we live. And when I talk about the spiritual, I, I talk about the motivations and attitudes and deep values that we have that motivate us to that motivate us in our profound um, attitudes towards what we're going to do about this environment, both physical and social. How are we going to 
Are we going to deal with it constructively? Are we going to have destructive attitudes? How are we, what is our spiritual attitude towards uh, our relationship to this holistic uh, environment? So this takes us to the question of a uh, risk uh, assessment. Um, and I, it was interesting for me to see that perhaps um, as, as we engage in these conversations, I'm trying to understand what are some connections between the language that anthropologists use and the language that local communities use and the language that those involved in uh, investment assessment um, and policy making uh, are using. And I found that the language of risk assessment is perhaps where connections can be made. Um, now, one of, the, um, one of the main forms of risk that people are looking at is political risk. So it seems that that's when we're looking at the Belt and Road Initiative, many investors um, say that that's where we have a lot of risk that is very difficult to handle. Now, of course, um, the uh, impacts on the physical environment have a direct bearing on political risk. Uh, when um, environmental degradation and destruction leads to the exacerbation of political conflicts and instability, or when political opposition is arising and opposition to environmentally damaging investments. So there's a direct uh, connection between um, sustainable physical environment and the mitigation of political risk. Now, when we're looking at this connection, though, there's two aspects to that. There's a subjective dimension and the objective dimension. So just as it was very interesting that uh, Dr. Ma was talking about, it was when he was at a meeting in Beijing and there was this thick smog that both he was motivated to do something and actually leaders in China were also motivated. So this was the result of a subjective perception of what was objectively going on and in other places, for example, I come from Canada and the environment is usually subjectively perceived as quite clean there. So we are often not so motivated to do things. Um, so our, our subjective perception of the environment is a very important driver of how we respond um, to uh, different types of changes. And these perceptions are connected to the social and spiritual environment. In other words, our values, our culture, um, our political uh, dynamics, our spiritual attitudes deeply influence the way we subjectively respond and act in response to changes. So, so if we're looking at risk, of course, it seems to me just speaking very simply that there are several levels of risk. Uh, there's the local level, the national level, and the international. And these are all in, uh, intertwined and mutually influencing each other. Um, so um, um, uh, how are local communities responding to investments? How are national uh, public sphere, the national governments and public opinion responding to investment? How is the, geo, uh, the, the, the geopolitical or the international environment affecting investments generally or in specific country? If we look at the local level, how are local populations responding uh, two different types of investments. Do they see it as opportunities that can be seized in order to improve their lives? Do they see it as something that they have to adapt to, whether more or less actively or passively? Is it something that they are in opposition to? Or is it, as we see different groups that see different types of benefits from uh, investments and changes, does this lead to divisions or exacerbation of pre-existing divisions within the local community? So what is the social impact and what is the social response to these impacts at the local level? And actually, we may find that the situation at a locality might be quite different from the general situation in a whole country at the national level. And yet there are feedback loops between these. When we have political parties, um, NGOs, media, and so on, either relaying concerns from the international or national level down to the local level and uh, leading to transformations of discourse at the local level or in the other direction, problems at the local level then being relayed upward and influencing the national discourse or even the international one. So we see a lot of feedback loops between all of these different levels. So if we're thinking about 
win-win, as this is an important feature of the conceptualization of the Belt and Road Initiative. So how can we think about local win-win? So when we're talking about people, planet, and profits, so how can we think about win-win for local people, for local planet, and for local prosperity? And if we really think about how to engage in local win-win, then perhaps this is an important foundation for reducing risk at not only the local level, but also reverberating to the national and international level. So how can this local engagement take place? And I think this is an area that needs to be researched and discussed. How can meaningful local participation and engagement be connected to these important discourses and consultations and policy making and um, norm setting that is being done uh, at the uh, at the at places like Hong Kong, Beijing, London, and so on, where a lot of the the means for the allocation of resources are being made. How can these connections be be? How can how can local um, um, uh, processes be connect be instigated and connected to these more global types of discourses? I think this is an important area of research, and I think um, it's hard to say, but I just wanted to share one example of a process which is called We Value, which um, I've been collaborating with um, uh, since about a decade ago, uh, which has been led by Professor Mary Hardinger of Fudan University and uh, Brighton University, which is a process of really uh, of, of bringing local communities together, um, uh, facilitating a process for them to articulate their values, what is important to them, um, turn those into um, explicit frameworks and narratives, which can then be connected to um, global sets of measures, indicators, and so on, and which can be um, then inputted into decision supporting tools um, and other types of uh, discourses um, and, uh, and norms. Um, and so um, it was very interesting that um, um, this, this approach had begun in, in the United Kingdom about 10 years ago. Uh, we were involved in um, modifying and applying it here in Hong Kong with a major social service provider here in Hong Kong. And then later, um, the approach was further developed and localized uh, and indigenized in mainland China and other places such as Bhutan, uh, Nigeria, Indonesia, and so on. And so um, this, uh, uh, this example perhaps offers some clues as to how we can think about um, integrating locally based um, processes of um, um, assessment uh, and perhaps some of these different things such as um, um, def defining what is it, what does green mean for local community? So to define, to disclose information or to share information, to have incentive, uh, to develop local types of intense, uh, incentives and just forms of transition at the local level. So I just wanted to bring up those questions um, and I really look forward to future uh, discussions uh, so that we can advance this area of discourse and research. Uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.